To get the Big Buck Registry after show and other exclusive content right now, go to patreon.com forward slash big buck registry. Today on Deer Hunt. There was a, he was hunting in an area where he couldn't get the cell coverage. He had to climb up on other tree stands and then finally locate his spot to the point where he could call in emergency people to come in through a gate. There was a lot of time that passed before he was actually able to leave in an ambulance. All could have been prevented with the right equipment. Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 295. J. Scott Ammon. That's me, Big Buck Registry creator, editor-in-chief, featuring the Where to Hunt Podcast. Support for the Big Buck Registry and the Deer Hunt Podcast comes from Minus 33 Merino Wool Layering System, keeping you warm on the coldest days while staying breathable and wicking away moisture on the wet ones. Rackology. Everything you need in one bag. Now available at Rural King and Orsland Farm and Home storefronts. Or online at www.rackology.org. Grizzly Ears. The most advanced engineered wireless earbuds for the outdoors. Covert scouting cameras. Remote cameras for hunting, wildlife, and security. Grizz friction wood calls. Custom made calls that sound as good as they look. Mountain Deer Taxidermy. If you can dream it, we can make it. www.mountaindeertaxidermy.com And Big Buck Merch. You can get cool, high-quality Big Buck t-shirts, long-sleeve t-shirts, hoodies, hats, and more. And show support for this podcast by visiting bigbuckmerch.com. That's bigbuckmerch.com. This is Big Al Morris with Fox Pro Game Calls, and you're listening to my favorite deer hunting podcast, the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hi, this is Ben Rising with Whitetail Edge. Sit tight because you're about to listen to the best podcast that you possibly can listen to, the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. This is Chancey Walters with Whitetail Adrenaline and Big Buck Runner. You're about to listen to my favorite podcast, the Big Buck Registry. Hello, ladies and gentlemen and fellow predators. My name is Jay, and thank you for tuning in to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. For Dusty Phillips and Jim Keller and the entire staff here at the Big Buck Registry, welcome to the show. There are a couple things I'd like you to do for us if you could. If you would, please check us out on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, and leave us a review. With your help, we're going to try and push this show up the iTunes charts. I know we have a lot of listeners out there, and I need you to take some action. I need you to leave a review and subscribe to the show. If you do subscribe, that'll give you access and notification each and every week that a new show is released. You can also access this show in its entirety on YouTube, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, and as an Amazon Alexa skill. Go to Alexa and say, Alexa, enable Big Buck Registry. It's all right there for you to access on demand at your fingertips. Regarding the harness program, we're out of harnesses. We need your help. Anybody that has spare harnesses, please send an email to j at bigbuckregistry.com. Recently, I appeared on the Where to Hunt podcast for an opportunity to share more about the BBR and to share my story behind my 2019 New Hampshire buck. Since that interview, lots has changed in the world. I had cardiac catheter surgery where cardiologists found a 95% blockage in my Widowmaker cardiac artery. Two stents later, I'm feeling better than ever. And then there's the COVID-19 issue. Man, we can't wait for deer season, and you can't catch the coronavirus walking alone in the woods. Be safe, everyone. We'll get to the entire interview where I appeared on the Where to Hunt podcast in just one moment. But before we do, let's hear from our friends at Minus 33 Merino Wool Products and Jim Keller with the Deer News. My experience started with a visit to the Minus 33 headquarters in Ashland, New Hampshire, for a tour of the warehouse and factory, followed by an interview with John Glidden, the owner and CEO. John is a straight-shooting New Hampshire Yankee, if ever there was one, and that straight-shooting attitude reflects in his product. It's high-quality stuff that does exactly what the company says it will do. After a steady hike on a cold November day up the backside of a steep New Hampshire ridge, with the sun setting and the temps dropping, I wasn't soaked with sweat. Because of the minus 33 merino wool base layer, I was comfortably warm and dry and itch free. Any perspiration was wicked away from my body and my human scent was neutralized from the natural properties that the wool brings to the table. I was thankful that I was wearing that exact base layer when that dominant buck appeared. 
Rest assured, I'll be wearing my minus 33 merino wool base layer next year when the temperatures start to drop. I'd encourage you to check out minus 33 for yourself. Visit www.minus33.com, that's M-I-N-U-S 33.com, and grab some base layers for the rest of this season or next. And please let them know you heard about them on the show by using the discount code BIGBUCK33 to get 10% off your next order. Now here's Jim Keller with the deer news. Our first story this week, poacher of trophy deer faces felony and big fine by less than an inch. This story is from the USA Today website and was reported by David Stridgey. A 29 year old man was charged with a felony after he was discovered having illegally killed a mule deer whose antler spread was a half inch longer than the minimum length used for restitution for a Utah trophy deer. In the 5th District Court in Salt Lake City, Ethan LeBaron was charged with wanton destruction of protected wildlife by using spotlights at night to kill the deer, in this case, a third-degree felony. He was also charged with tag, a tagging requirement violation, a Class B misdemeanor, by the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. Charges are still being considered for the two men who were with LeBaron. A buck whose antler spread measures 24 inches or more makes it a trophy and illegally killing one is a felony level offense in Utah. It calls for a minimum restitution of $8,000. LeBaron's deer measured 24 and a half inches. Had it been under 24 inches, it would have been a class A misdemeanor and the restitution would have been a minimum of $400. LeBaron was discovered by conservation officers using archery equipment and a spotlight to shoot and kill a buck near Kitchapaw Canyon in Iron County at around 10.30 p.m. on August 20th. A witness had called the UTIP hotline to report seeing spotlights in the dark because it was archery deer hunting season and the witness worried illegal hunting was occurring. Hunting deer at night is illegal, as is wasting game. Two conservation officers arrived on the scene and found three men and the dead deer. Because the animal had not been field dressed, the meat had spoiled and was unable to be donated. Wisconsin shed hunters find what may be the biggest buck in Wisconsin history. This story is from the Guns America website and was reported by Jordan Michaels. A deer and shed hunter in Wisconsin recently found what might be the biggest set of whitetail antlers in Wisconsin history. The record for the biggest deer in Wisconsin ever to be found or killed is 253 inches, and that record has stood for 47 years. Nate Olson and a friend, Travis Worthrich, were shed hunting February 1st when they came across the deadheads of two bucks who had died with their horns locked together. It's a relatively frequent occurrence among redding males, and game wardens have used a variety of means to unlock the antlers, including shooting them off. These deer weren't fortunate enough to run into a game warden, and they died with their antlers still attached to their skulls. When Olson saw the 23-point rack, he was so surprised he couldn't speak. Withrich recalls that Olson turned to say something to him when Olson noticed the antlers under a tree. Another of Olson's friends, Mike Hackett, had been tracking the deer for three years on his trail cam. The current Wisconsin record holder is a 30-point Buffalo County buck killed in 1973 that scored B&C 253. Olson believes this buck will beat the record, and the Gazette Extra reports that a Wisconsin Buck and Bear Club representative agreed with Olson's assessment. The official measurement will be taken the first week of April at the Wisconsin Field and Stream Deer and Turkey Expo in Madison. Olson wishes he had the chance to shoot the buck himself, but is nonetheless happy with the result. The buck was found just south of a town called Ofordville in southern Wisconsin. Legislation would get rid of Minnesota shotgun-only deer hunting zones. This story is from the Star Tribune website and was reported by Tony Kennedy. Minnesota would do away with shotgun-only zones for deer hunting if the legislature this year takes up a bill that recognizes changes in firearms technology and usage. Senator Jeff Howe, a Republican from Rockville, is chief author of the shotgun bill. He said support for the initiative will be coming soon from the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association, the largest hunting group in the state. He introduced the bill in 2019, he said, because shotgun-only zones for deer hunting don't make sense anymore. For one thing, Howe said, it's legal for coyote hunters to use rifles all over the state. Secondly, shotgun-only zones were created years ago as a herd control measure in areas where deer were scarce. It was thought that hunters would kill fewer deer with shotguns because slugs had notably less range than bullets fired from a rifle. Howe said rewriting the regulation would eliminate confusion over the use of high-powered long-distance pistols for deer hunting. Deer hunters are going to be on board with this and the DNR is fine with it, Howe said. The proposal could be held back out of concern that it might draw unfriendly amendments, 
If so, the hunting regulation proposal could be transformed into a controversial hunt gun legislation. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry's Deer News. Special thanks to Daniel Applebaum and John Geis for leads on stories this week. For links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have any ideas for future topics or have questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Thanks to Jim Keller for the Deer News. Without further ado, here is me on the Where to Hunt podcast. One of the OGs of podcasting, Jay Scott from the Big Buck Registry. He's got the most beautiful voice in the world. He's got an awesome podcaster's voice. Uh, I bet that's probably one of the first deer hunting podcasts I listened to, Mm -hmm. in fact. What's up, Jay? How you doing? I'm doing well. Is this the okayest podcast in the Midwest or what? (laughs) Well, at least in this area. Yes, it is. We got to set that bar real low, (laughs) just just in case we mess up. (laughs) I appreciate you having me on, guys. Yeah, man. We're we're excited. Um, We connected a couple years ago. We crossed paths. We were doing stuff with the Outdoor Podcast channel. Um, yep. and haven't crossed paths until again now in uh, 2020. So, you know, excited to have you on. You've been, you do a weekly show. You've been at it since 2005, 2012, somewhere in there, but we're going to kind of hear about a little bit about who you are and how you got into all that and what kind of led you to where you're at today. Sure. Sounds good. What do you want to know first? Well, let's see. What's your favorite color? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I, I can start it off. So Red. Nice. Blood. Blood red. Uh, <laughs> there you go. So you've been doing this for a while. Up to up to you doing this, I mean, is this a full-time gig for you, or is this a, kind of a hobby along with hunting and outdoor stuff? So, yeah, so like my full-time gig that I've been doing for 20-something years, I'm actually a, a, a loan officer for a mortgage banker up here in the Northeast, and it's um, it's afforded me a, a schedule where I can kind of pay attention to my podcasting world and it, originally it was just a, a hobby to see kind of where it goes and, and what it would do and it, it it's blossomed into a business and it's not it's not my full-time gig sometimes it feels like I put enough hours into it to be a full-time <laughs> gig but it's really I'm really a loan officer by day and a podcaster by night it is you know it's when I Put on my my Batman uh, uniform and, and turn into the, the the podcaster. Cool, I like that. Do you put a mask on too? Because no one can see you, right? If you're doing it, I might I might try yeah, to do that next time. Right? Oh, we we do that. We do some live shows like you guys, like we're doing right now. Um, yep. But uh, usually, sometimes it's by face, and I'll have my co-hosts come in, and we'll uh, and our guests will try to get them on like a a blue jeans type scenario where we can see everybody's face and kind of thing but that's there's some other advancements in that realm uh lately so we'll probably explore some of that this year yeah it's ever evolving um, right ever ever evolving it's always there's always something new some new fancy software that you can tap into and and make it uh, better audio quality better better video quality do live stuff so i love what you guys are doing with this live thing that's great um you don't don't see a lot of podcasters brave enough to go live uh i like to edit i've always liked to edit but you know there's so much stuff that can go wrong and uh, you know you forget something or the you ask the question wrong you stumble you know that that's the real deal behind the scenes but um the uh, the live stuff is i think where a lot of people like this you know the people like the live stuff so i think it's pretty cool yeah it keeps it it keeps it authentic uh i think and it, it is a little bit different um you know, I like to just roll with stuff. I, I can't tell you how many technical errors or word slip ups or F bombs gotten dropped. Or stabbing yourself sure. with a screwdriver. Right. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. I stabbed myself yeah. with a screwdriver one time. Um <laughs> so it definitely is interesting. How did you um how did you start? Like what was it like in the early, you know, like two thousand five? Like I didn't even know what a podcast was when I started this and I you know, I just kinda jumped in head head first and I didn't have a clue what I was doing, right. uh, but here we are today. I, I'd love to hear your story because you were way ahead of me. So in 05, uh, it wasn't called podcasting, although I, I guess uh, podcasting had no roots somewhere around 2005. But what I was trying to do was to use 
my um, some kind of recording device to interview people in in marketing or business and and get into the the marketing world a little bit more maybe to help advance my my mortgage career that I'm in but also to explore another realm have some uh like a, a creativity part of of my life and so I bought some recording equipment I bought some uh, condenser mics which are if you know what the difference between the mics are they're condenser and dynamic and podcasting dynamic you have to speak right into it to get sound and then there's condensing mics which picks up uh, sound all the way around which is fine if you're in a very tight sealed room but if you've got kids running around or you know cat meowing in the background or or any kind of background noise interruption dynamics the way to go and, and so dynamic mics uh, versus the the condenser mics i had no idea what the two were so i just bought something that looked good and i bought the condenser mics also bought this um it's a it's a little white box and i forgot exactly who made it but you basically plug your mics in there and it was supposed to go on your computer but the computer wasn't really fast enough to read the the recording, much like any software today, will, will record directly into a computer, whether it's Audacity or whatever. But that's what that was supposed to do, and it was very complicated. It never really worked right. It could never get the sound really, you know, studio quality. And uh, basically threw in the towel back in 05. I was like, okay, none of this is going to work. Um, I'm, I'm done fighting with it. There will be another time when, when this will resurface. I'll try this again somewhere down the road. So it, it sat on the shelf, collected dust for seven years. And then uh, Facebook kind of came alive. Like it, was, it became a thing. And it was back in the day before Facebook is like it is today, where it was owned. It was a public, now it's a publicly owned company back then. It was private. It was the Wild West on Facebook. You could do pretty much anything. You could get anybody to look at your page. You could you could uh, create real estate basically by doing these things share to share where you you uh, you'd share one page on yours and they would do uh, likewise. And you could run an ad for short money. And I remember the ad I ran. It was a um, I, I let me back up just a little bit. I, I created the Facebook page first, and it was created after my friend. Steve had shot a 240-pound buck in New Hampshire. Wow. If you know, New New Hampshire is where I live. It's where I've hunted my whole life. And Steve, uh, (laughs) it was such a wacky afternoon. But the way it it all played out, Steve was on his way to Connecticut. He lived, uh, he lives in New Hampshire just up the road from me. And he he, he jumped in his truck. It was muzzleloader season. He was on his way to, to Connecticut. And he, he's driving down the road. He looks over on, onto the swampy area that's right next to the road with some uh, power lines that run across. And he sees this big, good-looking buck, uh, a doe, and a smaller spike standing there 40, 50 yards off the road. Um, and, and it was muzzleloader season. So that, that would have been early or late October, early November in New Hampshire. And uh, instead of going to Connecticut, he drove back to his house. 15, 20 minutes, got his muzzle loader, drove, he wasn't on a hunt or anything, drove back to the spot, walked into the woods, drops this 240 pound buck, and then calls me as he has for years and years. Hey, Jay, can you come help me drag out my deer? So uh, the, the, the Facebook page had kind of launched at that point. That was 2012. Um, and I wanted to make the podcast. So I would drag this buck out, it weighed 240 pounds. And, it's like, you know, I really need to share this stuff because I got a friend who was my hunting partner in New Hampshire for a long time. He's moved to North Carolina. I hunted down there with him, but he sends me pictures of all these bucks he's seeing. I don't see a lot of bucks in New Hampshire. Usually if you see it, that's the one you're going to gonna hunt and kill. Um, if um had another friend move to Montana, he sent, you know, he was there like five days. He sends me a picture of an antelope he kills. And then a buck a week later. So I was like, we were sharing pictures back and forth. That then I was like, you know, this is exactly why Facebook was created to share pictures. So I I started sharing my friend's pictures on a Facebook page that I just randomly created. Keep in mind, this is this is 2012, and it got a lot of hits. And it started, and I had to name it something. So um, Big Buck Registry came to mind. And part of that is a, a source. A great name, by the way. Right, like that's just a great it, name. 
it, it seemed like it had traction. It was uh, the registry. I was actually in a uh, a registry of deeds. I was at the registry of deeds in my other world one afternoon. I'm like still pondering what I'm going to call this thing, and it came up registry. It has to be a registry of something. If people are going to share pictures, even though you might not be like actually putting it on, on a ledger or anything, I'm going to have a picture to share. Somebody's going to share a picture on this page. So that would be the registry part. And it'll be Big Buck. It's pretty simple. Everybody can spell it. Big Buck Registry. That's what it's going to be. So it actually stems from the mortgage world and the real estate community, community with the registry part. And brought it into my other world that I wanted to get into, which was the deer hunting world. So Big Buck Registry was created. And started as a Facebook page. The Facebook page blew up pretty quickly. Uh, I think I ran a couple of small ads for pennies on the dollar using some of my own money. And it was, it was really short money. But before long, and, after, and as a goal of mine, I just wanted to have 10,000 followers on Facebook. That was like, a, that was like a, a level that you wanted to get to initially. And before I knew it, I was at 10, then I was at 20, then I was at 40. And this was probably in the course of a few months. And what I what I had taken was I, there was a picture that a, a fellow somewhere I think it was in Missouri had sent in, and it was a great photo. It was a great backdrop, big buck. And all I wrote was, "Do you want to learn how to kill bucks like this?" And I sent it out to the Facebook community, and that drove that drove it up to a hundred thousand followers in oh, a few crap. years. And uh, then I and I and I, I stopped doing advertising after the first year. So I, and I didn't spend a whole lot of money, but it, it built it up to a hundred grand um, in quite a short amount of time, plus the share to share stuff, plus content. So there's a lot of organic stuff. There was some paid stuff. And I, then I stopped it all together. And from there it grew organically to where it is today over the, I think it was a couple of years later. Um, I surpassed 200,000. I think it's somewhere around 270 now. So simply just driving, putting content out there, um, I knew I had something to work with. And then I, I thought back to that 05 experience. So like, you know, now's the time to bring those old mics out. Well, hmm. did the research. Cliff, Cliff Ravenscraft from, um, they had a, had a great podcast channel. And I, he was what working was with somebody again? else. I can't remember it. It was... I can uh, I can Google it and, and figure it out. I forgot uh, exactly. I followed him too early on because he was the guy teaching people how to podcast. The po- podcast answer man. There you go. The podcast answer man. Oh my gosh, this is like yeah. nostalgic. Right. Sorry, so dear podcast hunters, we're geeking out on podcasting, but I know a lot yeah, of these deer hunters are podcasters. Kind of geeky, and this isn't a really hunting thing. This is a podcast thing. And it's a Cliff Ravenscraft podcast answer man. And uh, there was a guy over at the Audacity podcast that was teaching some stuff too. But I, I watched a lot of his YouTube videos. I talked to him by by email, and you know they're always trying to get you to buy their course, go go spend the weekend yeah. and learn how to podcast. And I'm like I'm not going to really do that. There's so many things here for free on on YouTube. I'll just do that. I might take a few pieces from his stuff and some couple other things from from his other things. But I basically had this. I had my iPhone. I had a jumble of wires. Who knows where they're plugged in? And I had a little device where I could plug in a, a, a f- microphone cord. And I had actually bought a, an Audio Technica uh, microphone that was pretty cheap. And my whole goal was not to spend too much money to get this off the ground because I didn't know if it was, if it was going to take off. And I certainly didn't want to drain the bank. It was just a hobby. And I already, you know, I spent plenty of money on hunting. I didn't really want to have another expensive hobby. So this is just going to be a trial, see what would happen. And, but I knew the Facebook page took off. I knew a lot of other hunters out there and it was cool to see what everybody else was hunting, but how was I going to learn what, how they were hunting them? How was I going to learn how they were killing these big bucks all across the country? And I realized that there's a whole bunch of knowledge out there that everybody, or a lot of people were experiencing, but nobody was collectively putting it in one spot where you could sh- you could learn a lot if you just arrived at this one place about deer hunting, because I was trying to become a better deer hunter. I did become a pretty good turkey hunter, but I always felt like deer hunting was a little distant from me. Like I wasn't as good as I wanted to be. But if I could talk to these people across the country who were sending in these pictures, clearly they know something I didn't. 
And this podcast could not only help me become a better deer hunter, but if I could capture all that audio and put it into one collective, it could probably help a lot of other people too. And then that would just build on the Facebook page. And that's pretty much how it all got started. It just, it, it was, it, a lot of the early guests were simply from people who had sent in pictures on the Facebook page and they were doing something. One of which is still with me today, Dusty Phillips, uh, one of my co-hosts, he sent in one of the first pictures ever. And I, and I talked to him a little bit, um, by, by, uh, messenger. And then I talked to him on the phone, I said, maybe I'll, he should be a guest. So I made him a guest and he was a funny guy. He had a great, good storyteller, <laughs> you know, and, and that's kind of how it all blossomed. It just kept going. I kept finding more and more people, not only who, who had killed a, a good deer, but they wanted to share the story. And I think that was an important piece. Like they, they wanted to get it off their chest and it's like going talking to anybody, you know, for years and years, I'd go hunt with my, my, um, my wife's uncles and they, they're, they're fun to hunt with, but they told great stories and I it mesmerized me. So it's like, you know what? The, a deer story is such a great thing to tell. And if I can, not only tell, get the, these people to tell the deer story, but to get them to open up and, and tell me about their life, how they kind of, I can do a good backstory, figure out how they developed and help other people become better hunters too. The concept is fantastic. And you're talking about an era that I think I was on a similar wave. You poured some gas on that fire. I was probably a little too young and ignorant still, still in college full time, trying to figure out, oh, I got all these people engaging with this content on Facebook. I cracked 10,000. I, I probably fell off after that at some point. But same, it was like same as Facebook. Wow, look at all these people that are interested in deer hunting that, you know, I can learn from. I should put a podcast out because I just heard about this podcast thing. And then a couple years later, I see this this guy sends me a message asking me I want to go shoot, you know, a bow at a local archery shop. Turns out his name's Greg Tubbs, and now he's my co-host. Um, our, our stories aren't too dissimilar at all. That's, that's really interesting. Um yeah, the, the I, I name, think that's uh, – go ahead. I was just going to say the name registry, I like to hear that it came from the mortgage industry. I always interpreted it as like you would always go register your deer. Um, we used to have right, registration right. stations. So that's where I that's where I assimilated the word there's from. A, there's a lot of good stories registered at the registry. Mm-hmm. That is true. And, 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 I, and I, that was also like in the mix. I knew that go to a registration station, that was kind of part of it. And, you know, there's always great stories being pulled at the, at the registration station. If you go yep. hanging out at the scales, you always hear these great stories. And, um, I, I would go to just, just to hang out at the scales, you know, there's a little diner there. You'd have a little, something to eat, grab a coffee, go down, see who's bringing in what, talk to them, find out what the stories were. Uh, so yeah, there's, there is some elements there. It wasn't, it wasn't all the registry. It just happened to be, that's kind of when I decided it's probably that, but there were other connotations to it or other meanings certainly with the registration stations for sure yeah it's cool it's cool it's really evolved i mean you're um you know almost to episode 300 do you have any plans for the 300th episode or maybe you can't talk about them um but i just realized you're pretty close to that mark i wonder if you're going to do a milestone party or something you know i, I think it, there is something that'll special that'll happen i don't have it quite ironed out yet but i i got thinking about it um a, a couple months ago, I was like, you know, we're going to approach 300, and it's time to do something kind of special. Um, not exactly sure what it's going to look like yet. I've still got a little bit of time. We've we've uh, trimmed it back to two a month instead of weekly. The weekly thing was just a little overwhelming when my as my kids got older and I needed to be more places and do more things with them, uh, coach baseball and all that stuff. There wasn't as much time, so but we're still putting out two a month and. The um, I'm not exactly sure what it's going to look like, but it will in- involve my co-host. It'll probably involve a few of my previous guests uh, sure. that, that we really think a lot of, and um, hopefully make it something special. I'm not. I'm going to look to see what other people have done at 300. But yeah, it's it's going to be a big deal. That's cool. Um, hopefully, you don't lose your voice like I did at my 100th. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were sicker than a dog, though. Whatever you had caught was not not. Did pretty. you get it then too? I did. I got it like a week later. 
Yeah, you were pretty mad at me for that. <clears throat> yeah, well, I one... missed it, though, too. I also missed the next. Yeah, that's right. You did. Yeah, I brought in a different co You brought in Anthony. A temporary one, Anthony. <laughs> the Greg replacement I, for a minute. That's I haven't funny. lost my voice on a show yet, although there was one I kind of would. where I, I, was, I was getting sick as a dog. Um, and I had this guy named Adam Evans. He's the podcast. Uh, no, not the podcast. Not the podcast answer, man. He's the... He's a weatherman. He's uh, basically a New England, right? He's um, he, he was this, he's this great guy, and he's developed this character that is hardcore, back not backwards, but hardcore um, traditional New Hampshire, uh, New England, where he talks with a good New Hampshire accent, and he's called the hillbilly weatherman. <laughs> and he, he did it as a as kind of a, a gag with his his son, his son started laughing every time he got into this gig. But, I mean, he doesn't hold back. He swears. Um, I don't know if you can swear on this show, but... Uh, sure oh, can. Yeah. Let it rip. Yeah. He, he, basically, he'd say, he'd get up on and say, well, we got a load of weather coming in here, and uh, you guys <laughs> better get your Subarus off the road now and let the big trucks <laughs> come through. So that, and that was kind of the premise of how he did it, but he does such a great character that it's it's endless. He's not really that guy in real life, but I had him on the show um, because it turns out he's a deer hunter. You know, he wasn't just this this goofy guy on on Facebook who was just knocking it dead on on uh, with with likes and and views, but he ended up uh, coming into my my studio in my house, and because he only lived. In, Turned out he was from New Hampshire and not too far away. He came in and we talked about deer hunting and the hillbilly weatherman, how he developed all that stuff. But I had, I couldn't hear out of my right ear. And uh, I had, I had gone through like this flu kind of thing and I was be- kind of better. My voice was still there, but the next day I got vertigo. I couldn't walk down the hallway oh, without bumping geez. into the wall, falling down. It was awful. It turns out I had an ear infection the whole time he was here and, I, I can remember that it got just the headphones on the head was was making my head and or my ears really warm. Like that's just really weird, but it's like burning up. Well, it turns out I was uh, kind of second stage sickness there after the the cold had gone away, and then I got into some infection stuff. So that was that was the worst um, that it's ever been. But it it's still I still got the show out, and you still got the show out, right? <laughs> Craig, I'm like, the show must go on always. Oh God, it must go on. That's how I felt. It's uh, right. it means you're the real deal. You know, you, you can't mess around. Look, I got an audience that we got to record for. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, it's always funny. I always assume that no one listens. Obviously, the numbers you know don't reflect zero, but I just treat it that way. And I'm always humbled by any single person that says something about the show at any point in time. And I feel like if I miss one, someone's going to be like, "Hey, where's my Wednesday morning commute?" You know. But tomorrow's Wednesday, right? Today's Tuesday? Yeah. Yes. On Tuesday. On Tuesday. Yeah, it, it is funny. You don't hear a lot usually. It's only when you stop or don't do something that they really jump on you. So wait, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Where was that comments when I was doing this? Yeah, I wait, to hear got, that. Come on. Right. Yep. That's like one of the things uh, we'll, we'll post on uh, Facebook. One, there are a few things that have developed over the years that have kind of become part of the Big Buck Registry. One is, is the we do a during deer season, we'll do a weekly deer movement prediction. And it's based on, it's Sol Lunar is based off the moon. You can get it pretty much anywhere. It's, it's free, it's online, but we post it in an image and people go crazy over this image. And the minute that we don't do it, that one week we don't do it on Saturday at noon, people go mental. They will call in, they will email us, they'll say, can I, and they want it special for them, so they'll ask for it on their, their, uh, through messenger or emails and but all, it's just one image that you can get on online for free it's just funny everybody wants that one consolidated spot now does it help their hunt yeah you know the verdict's out on that i don't know but yeah who they knows? certainly it's look forward to it right hand on the scale yep so that's, that's kind of funny. funny yeah the other thing that we've done and this was completely inadvertent it was we have this program called the harness program and you guys buy tree stands, obviously, right? And every tree stand that you buy comes with those harnesses packed in a nice plastic pouch, and it gets thrown in the corner, and you never look at it again because you bought either a nice one or you don't use one or whatever. And I, 
I was like, ah, I'll throw them up on Facebook, see if anybody wants one. Because I had three in the garage. And uh, sure enough, instantly, everybody wanted it. So I mailed them out. And then I said, well, maybe there's a lot of people out there who don't have one for some reason. They're hunting out of these other stands or old stands. And that before TMA launched the requirement to have these as part of safety code, as part of every tree stand, or maybe it's some some financial situation, whatever the case may be, it's probably a good idea to form a program generated through the podcast where we do a, a, a harness exchange. So those that buy new stands that have these things can either get them to us or just hold them until we identify somebody that emails us a request for a harness. And we get people that are, are younger or, or a parent who wants to take a kid hunting or um, I, uh, I'm kind of down on my luck right now. I really can't afford one. I just got a free tree stand for my buddy, but I don't have a harness. I don't want to fall out of the tree. Or if I do, I'd like to have something. What can you do? So between a, co- a combination of people donating, people requesting them, or some people just sending in a couple bucks to cover shipping, we've created this harness program and it kind of keeps on going. It, it It's never really died. So it's, they, we build up inventory, then it disappears. We have to change our message on the podcast. Say, hey, we're out of harnesses. Let's um, let's go and get let's raise some more and find some people that can bring some in. That's a so I heard that being talked about on one of your recent episodes. Is that something that you're still actively doing now? I, it sounded like maybe yes. um, it sounded like you ran out and you were looking for donations. Was. Okay. Yeah, we have I'm run out of harnesses that. at the moment. Yep. And that, so that's it's all so it is. popular it's that you really run out of them. I think I have some. I was just it's pointing so, to Greg. I think right. I have some on the floor. Yeah. See, there's everybody has them, and turns out there are a lot of people that need them. I've still got a back order of requests that have not been fulfilled yet. So I, I think this year we're going to try to push more uh, donors than recipients because the recipients seem to show up no matter what, but the donors kind of peter out. Like we tend not to have as many donors as we need. So yeah, if well, you guys could get the word out and we can, you know, save save a hunter from falling uh somewhere who knows when, but if we save one then that's that's plenty. Well, and two if you don't have guys out there buying as many tree stands, you know, I mean, I've I'm hunting out of the same old lone wolf tree stand I've had for the past 12 years and I'm pretty sure I gave that harness away to my godson or something, but you know, if you got guys that are just hunting out of quality gear to begin with and they don't go and replace it all the time or they don't add to their collection it's pretty hard to get you know get used harnesses i guess and then two because of the number of decline that we we're seeing in in hunter population that could be part of your problem as well it could be it could be i, I think um it seems like people are still buying enough tree stands and they're they're more if you have a tree stand, chances are if you buy more than one tree stand, you probably have one harness you're going to use. But mm-hmm. you're going to keep buying tree stands. If you're buying ladder stands anyway or, or you know, lock-ons right. or whatever, they usually come with this extra harness, and it gets either thrown away or nobody's using them. But there are plenty of people that need them and, and want them. So we just got to figure out a way to systematically get them over to them. Cool. We'll, uh, we'll help pump that out. Um, do you think – all the folks that are grabbing those up are using them for deer hunting? Or do you think there's some other applications? Has anyone communicated back to you that, well, I need it for something unrelated? Like, I don't know, are there linemen that are using this? Or I'm trying to think of other use line. cases. So or far, like that. I, I don't know how many we sent out, but it's been well over probably a couple hundred anyway. They've always 100% been interested because of deer hunting. Hmm. Yeah, that's really, that's really something. You've definitely kind of uh, uncovered something with that. I know, right? It was accidental, need. completely accidental. Yeah. Like, ah, I don't, I don't want these things. I have to go into the dump, or ah, who knows? I've got a, I've got this Facebook page. Let's put it to use. Let's put it to good use and see if there's a hunter that is in need and doesn't have the money to spend it or to spend on a brand new one. See what they, see if they could use this. And sure enough, and then just it just it's continued for I don't know two or three years now. Hmm. That is really interesting. Oh, that's a nice thing to do. That's really cool. I think yeah. so. I. I don't know if that's what I have down there. It might be. Um, what's the cost average, you know, to, to ship to you? I mean, obviously it depends on where it's coming from, but what do you think people, like if I was going to ship that to you, what am I going to pay from Wisconsin? Maybe like a couple bucks? 
Usually if you get the regional A box, which you sometimes have to order yeah. or can ask for at the post office, or if, you know, they'll fit in a, one of those plastic sleeves. It's typically running between seven and eleven dollars from anywhere in the country to ship, and hmm. it can coast to coast. But typically, it's in the in the bag, seven or eight bucks. So that's it, well, you know, I, it. Does take out. Go ahead. I'm the best person to interrupt anybody. Um, yeah, you're good at I it. You have to give that disclaimer. <laughs> well, I was just thinking, like, <laughs> you know. If the if the blocker is you aren't having enough, or if the if the symptom is you're not having enough people to donate, um, then there's plenty of people that want to receive them, and there still is a surplus of these things. And the blocker might be that, you know, the time perception of I got to put this thing and ship it and take it to post office and I got to pay or whatever that might be. I almost wonder if you got like, you know, a stand company or something that's you know um, concerned with safety or the hunter safety. Uh, there's like a hunter safety association association. Um, maybe you get like, you know, some of the sponsor just that program to cover just the cost of the shipping for the people sending those things in to, you know, make sure you get that surplus. I, I wonder if someone would get behind that for you and help because it's such a good cause. Yeah. Um, and if it's aligned it could, with their yeah. mission statement, that could that could help the the population at large. Definitely, I, I think that's something we could pursue and look at, and it really hasn't it's been an equal balance for quite a while. It wasn't until this last year that we saw an imbalance of, we finally ran out and Mm -hmm. we had lots of donors, but for a long time, we've been running the message that we're, we're fortified. We have plenty to give out. Well, it wasn't until a few months ago that the message has has changed where compound people are telling everyone about it now. now I gotta go find some more donors and, you know, it does add up, you know, you don't want to be sending out, um, $100 Hundred dollars worth of of gear if you do, if you don't have to. Um, so yeah, we're trying to. I think if you spread it out, everybody's willing to send one or two. But I don't know if you want to you know spend Christmas on uh, sending out harnesses to somebody that doesn't have one. It, yeah, d- despite it being an excellent cause, you know. Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I finally got a fancy harness this season. I, think I got it last year. Right. I started using it this season. Maybe it was last season. I think it was this season. It was a gift. Yeah, it's a weird thing to spend money on. It's like. They're not cheap, the nicer ones. It's not fun money. It's not like a shiny new bow, but you kind of want to get one of those. Yeah, you want to be able to make it home to your your family, though. <laughs> well, that's the yeah. yeah. And if you do have a, you know, if your widowmaker tree stand gives way. <laughs> yeah, the widowmaker. I was called I mean, Cadillac, but yeah. For years, I I never even used a harness, you know, and then I started. No, uh, not at all. Have it. Then I had had kids, and I'm like, I got to be a lot safer here. Um, so I started using a harness, and um, do, then I, I even stopped climbing for the, for quite a while while I had kids, and I didn't start climbing again until there was um, there was a, the, a a new company that came out with a product a few years ago where you you attach it to your your upper strap, and if you dropped or anything gave way, it would slowly lower you to the ground. They were a sponsor of ours for a little bit. And then I started climbing everywhere again. It was fantastic. I was hunting everywhere in a tree, mobile units, uh, climbers, wherever. It didn't matter. So I, my my love for being in tree uh, was resurrected. I, I never really disliked it. I just felt like the safety so that component, Big added risk. Big added risk. So... But that's that's been drastically reduced. You know, there's a, there's a lot of good safety equipment out there now that can help you climb trees. My dad was a was a lineman for the phone company growing up, so he, I used to watch him climb trees with his uh, metal spikes on this thing and a, li- a, a lineman's belt. And I was like, man, I want to do that someday. That looks awesome because he would fly up and down a, a telephone pole like it was nobody's business, like the loggers do on TV. Mm-hmm. And uh, so there's. You know, I always was fascinated by it and then started getting into the equipment. I, I realized why he liked doing it. It's kind of fun climbing a tree with a, <laughs> uh, you know, a rope and a, a belt and a, the right harnesses. And it's, it's a blast. That's cool. I learned how to do like uh, the, the bling, like where you run down the side of a building. That was pretty neat to do. Um, <laughs> I used to be quite a thrill seeker. And now, now with two little ones, I'm the same, like, I'm pretty clumsy also is the okay center. I can't tell you the number of times I like you're holding on to something with your teeth, you get one hand, you got a leg wrapped around. You're kind of like, you know, 
straddling the tree. I mean, there's so many awkward positions you find yourself and you drop something. And you're like, gosh, should I catch it? No, if I let go, I'm falling. You know, it's just, I wonder how many of us have all, have all been there. The safety stuff with the trees, that's the number one injury, falling out of a tree. Right. Uh, absolutely. That's the biggest, that's the biggest one, right? That's, um, that's the one where that hurts people the most. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The most and the, and the most, like the most common and it's right. like usually the most fatal. Um, well, right. Because it's more common. I think. And that was but, always the, that was the fear is like, I, I knew that stat now, you know, now I'm aware, uh, very well, very yeah, so aware you have of to address what the stat is. So now I got to address it. Mm-hmm. When I was younger, it didn't matter. I was wild and would do all that stuff. But these days, and uh, once the kids came along, everything changed. One of the one of the folks watching, uh, Jose, just commented and said, "I've come close, but never, I've never fallen." There's <laughs> been some, I, you know, my wife won't listen this far in, so I'm safe to say, unless she pops in randomly while I'm live here. But um, there's been close calls more when I was younger too, and I thought I could conquer the world and it didn't matter. I'm like, I don't need that stuff. You know, whatever. Yep. You know, a.k.a. the biggest good, idiot in the world. My very close friend, still to this day, good hunting buddies. We got to move to North Carolina years ago. And now we, we uh, hunt in Maryland together quite often. He fell out of a tree stand in North Carolina. And we we uh, chronologued the whole situation on an interview I did with him. And it was, he was a great interview. But we, he tells the entire story of what happened and how quickly things changed. And his experience of falling from the tree and trying to get emergency management in there to extract him from a very remote area in North Carolina. It didn't go so well. And uh, fortunately, it wasn't a, a fatal situation, but his leg uh, was completely demolished. So they had to re- rebuild completely. But it was, oh, it was, it's a nightmare. He fell from a long way up and it took a long time for the his buddy that he was hunting with even to get to him because he couldn't, there was a, he was hunting in an area where he couldn't get the cell coverage. He had to climb up at other tree stands just to get the coverage to call him where he was, and then f- finally locate his spot to the point where he could call in emergency uh, people to come in through a gate, and then had to get him down to the spot where the actual stand was. So there was a lot of time that passed before he was actually able to leave in an ambulance, um, but it all could have been prevented with the right equipment. Gosh. Well, folks, if you're listening to this at this point, um, <laughs> we've gotten on this tree safety topic, which I don't mind at all. It's not talked about enough, I don't think. I haven't heard a lot of folks talking about it. It's yeah. ebb and flow. It comes and goes, but it's always something. I mean, it it's the first thing that goes on me, you know, after I get all my hunting clothes on, mm-hmm. it's on. Mm-hmm. So the whole harness and, uh, you know, I hit the tree. You know, I don't always use my lineman's belt. If it's a short and real limmy tree, it's pretty hard to use a lineman's belt. But if it's a nice straight tree where I can use my lineman's belt to lean back and set a stick, yeah, you better believe I'm using it, you know. Uh, yep. But it's important, you know, and especially a lot of places I hunt, I'm over a mile from the truck. And if I'm the only one out there, and most of the time I am, um, I fall without that thing on, uh, it's going to be probably the end and you're right. going to have a hard time finding me unless you're using that weird app that we know about right <laughs> or you know into a lot of the areas the cell phone coverage sucks yeah so no that's the big one like that kills said. the battery yep does right. cold right. cell coverage it just drains it it's gotten to the point well, where where i'll create a map and take an image and send, or send my location to my wife she'll know where i'm I at i do that too i don't yep yeah i and I say, do not share this with anybody because I don't want everybody <laughs> to know where I'm at. I just want you to know where I'm at in the case of yep. emergency. And if I'll, I'm, when I get up in the tree, I'll text you. When I get down out of the tree, I'll text you. And I'll let you know I'm on my way back to the truck. Yep. The exact same rules apply. And if my wife doesn't hear from back from me you know, a little while after I've texted her from hitting the ground, getting out of the tree, then my phone's ringing in my pocket as I'm walking back right. to the truck. Oh crap! I forgot to text her. Well, yeah, she just she's concerned. She knows the areas I hunt, and they're not easy to get into. So, right, yeah, yep. Well, that's awesome. Something that's often well, overlooked, but very very important. But it helps you become self reliant too. You know, it keeps you accountable for yourself. Well, speaking of hard to get to exactly. places and, and all that stuff, um, you know, this might be a good time to pivot into the most memorable hunt. 
Jay, I know I asked you before we started recording to think of one and not share with us, but if you have a memorable hunt, we'd love to hear the story. Sure. Uh, I would say the, the most memorable uh, was this year, this past season, actually. And it is a story that goes back, let's say, three years, uh, maybe even four years. I had, I, you know, we all get on Google Maps, and uh, not all of us, but Google Maps has become a great asset for scouting, where you can set in your computer and start to look at areas that deer should be. And then it's uh, a ground, you know, a scout from there to see um, if it is in fact what you thought it should be. And then there's, uh, you know, the measuring to see if there's actually a buck in the area. So in in New Hampshire, it's it's pretty much all public land hunting. You you're allowed to hunt anywhere in New Hampshire as long as it's not posted, which is the opposite in a lot of states. It goes back to the colonial days. It's a very New England thing where um, it's great for turkey hunting. Now we have a great turkey population that you can basically go, go hunt the land even if you don't own it. Uh, it doesn't matter. That sounds as long awesome. as they say, yeah, it, it, it is quite an advantage. Understand that the, the wildlife in New Hampshire may not be what it is in other states, but we have that advantage for sure. There's no question. So you, know, you jump on your favorite mapping program and you're gone. You can be gone all day long and there's, you're not violating anything simply by crossing somebody's property line. It's, you're free to roam. Um, you're, obviously, it's good if there's like farmland or agriculture, but we're 85% timber. So you're going to be mostly in timber no matter where you are. Most people aren't going to know where you are. Most people don't even know that some of these places exist and there's the, the you can tell where most of the pressure is anyway but there are a lot of spots where hunters don't go it's hard to get to it's too too far up a, a mountainside or whatever so this particular area i had identified on google maps before the use of what i started using onyx as a potential spot and what i was looking at and, and a lot of this is kind of thanks to dan infault um, in the interview we did with him years ago was go on Google, look down onto the maps, zoom in on some of the swamps, and you'll see the old old deer tracks, the old deer paths going through the swamps. And if there's a lot of them, go check it out. If there's not, well, probably not a good deer spot. Well, this one one area I went, um, looked on Google, drove up there one day when I dropped my son off at a, a, a fall basketball practice and I just did a little quick scout and it seemed like it might be a good spot. Then I shelved it for three years. And this year, I was like, you know, I'm going to go back to that spot. I've always thought it was a good spot. I've hunted in areas around there, and those have always produced some good deer. But to this year, the deer aren't there. So where did they go? Well, that, this location that I identified three years ago might actually be where they go. It's uh, To describe it, there are roads that are all dirt, right? classic dirt road that go up into the hills of New Hampshire. And hills is not like a giant mountain, but certainly hilly enough. Um, and those then bra- those dirt roads branch off into four-wheeler trails or snowmobile trails that are used by snowmobilers in the wintertime. And it gets pretty remote I mean, to the point where you can get there by snowmobile, but try to walk there when the snow's not there. Um, it's going to take you a while and it's going to be straight uphill in certain spots. It's going to be rugged terrain. And, and even a four wheeler could probably get there, but then to get to the hunting spots, you get to break off of those four wheeler trails. So it gets pretty rugged. So on one side, there's a road that rides up onto this mountain, it goes up one side, comes down the other. It's all dirt. There's a side road that goes off of that. that goes up another peak. And that is essentially a snowmobile four-wheeler trail. And then off of there are two swamps on both sides at a gated area. And it was the, the, it was the swamp to the south that had interested me the most on the map. And one afternoon, um, preseason, uh, I think it was somewhere in October, still bow season, but I'm always scouting. So it's not like I ever stopped scouting. Um, took an afternoon, figured nobody would be out there. And, and ground scouted it and walked down through the, this area and got down to a big swamp, lots of lots of sign going down in. It was very congested, very thick. 
growth. You know, it's a great bedding area where these deer probably are. Got as far away from that gate as I, I could potentially get to the point where I was guessing that probably people wouldn't walk here. And it had, had some snow, and there wasn't a single boot track down where I had been, but there were deer tracks. There were a lot of deer tracks. There was good buck sign. The minute I got to the back side of the swampy area, there was, there was uh, trees rubbed. There were scrapes on both sides. It was very narrow and overgrown. It was almost like you're looking down a tunnel because it was so overgrown. Hmm. But it, it ended up on the back side of this peak. So I'm going in from the north, going south, and to the to the back side, you could see that where it kind of fell off. To the to the east, it was a sharp rise up the hill, and I'm on the top flat. And deer in New Hampshire always if, tend to go to the top third of the hills and love those little flat areas on the top. And I'm sure that's where that's common in a lot of other places, but you're gonna have mountainous terrain, and you gotta you kind of need that that timber. That's good perfect formula for New Hampshire. So I just ground scouted for an hour and a half, got out of there, decided that this is going to be a spot I'm going back to. Well, I drove up there one afternoon during gun season, and there was a guy there. Um, but he was coming out from the north over this other swamp, which is not what, I, what I, not what I wanted to see. But as he's walking out of the swamp, he pushed these two giant bull moose towards me, walked right in front of me, got it on video, and they... Guess where those moose mo- the moose went? They went exactly to the direction where I thought most game would go when when pressured. And this is exactly as I'm sitting there watching it develop. A guy is pressuring these these animals, and the the moose go exactly where I thought the deer would go. So fast forward uh, a week or so, um, it's the Monday before Thanksgiving, and as life goes, I have kids responsibilities. The wife has the day off for whatever reason that day. I said, hey, um, would you mind picking up the kids from school today? Because I'd, I'd like to go for a hunt if I could. And she said, sure. I said, great. Packed up all my gear. But instead of going in from the north, I decided to go in from the south. It really rained heavily the day before. And I had to find, go in from another dirt road from a whole different side of this, this mountain, basically. And the, I have my Jeep. I, use, I, I drive a standard Jeep. And the roads had been completely flooded up through so that there was a stream, big, thick streams running through this, all these roads trying to get into the spot. Well, I finally got there, and I still had to cross another stream that was completely swollen before I even started going uphill. So I got, I got across the streams, and it was it's this big, ledgy area. If you've ever been to New Hampshire, you'll understand, but... Basically, it's a it's a pretty sharp slope down, covered in these giant boulders that are all glacial. You know, they're just pushed pushed all around. And what I did was, instead of going straight to the spot, I sloped south and gradually went up the back side of the hill. And then going, what I was attempting to do was to get to the spot where I thought they were bedded, but get to a point where I could see a good visual because there had been some timber cut up in there in the last couple of years. And I took my time. Nice and slow, went in probably 1.30, but took my time, slow, methodical, quiet, staying completely downwind. And that's why I went in that direction mostly is because I knew the wind direction going in there that day. I wanted to stay downwind completely of any potential wind coming or going to their bedding areas. So I just stayed down downwind completely. And then when I got to the point of the backside of the ridge, I was at the high point, the highest point you could get in that one area. And then I, I slowly made my way down slightly through the shadows, staying under the branch covers. And I decided not to get up in a, a tree stand because I was, I was able to sit on the ground in the shadows with a good, decent amount of surrounding. But I could see, and this is unusual, you could see about 300 yards due north from where those moose came. And to the left, it was basically the, the end of the tunnel where all the bedding area was. So I was at the end of the tunnel, but you, you knew that they were going in and out of that tunnel area that I had scouted a few weeks earlier, and I could see probably 300 yards to the north. It was about 4.30. Um, sunlight was was starting to dim a little bit. Sun was going down. It was getting colder. It was getting down in the 30s. Um, not that that's cold, but it was, you know, in the 
mid thirties and starting to drop. And I have my 30 out six. I'm wearing my, uh, this is a plug for our sponsor, but I, I did have on my minus 33 Merino base layer, which is wool, which is a great, great way to, to stay warm and dry. And I've never really used wool until this year, but it's a, it's a game changer. Yeah, I can agree with you there. Right. Love wool. Wool is one of the best insulators of all time. And it it has this anti microbial uh, capacity or um, abilities where it doesn't smell. I don't know if you've ever smelled your wool coat. It doesn't smell. It's it's just well, a even natural the, property of wool. Yeah, merino wool. I got merino yep. wool, wool uh, undergarments as well. All my my layered system is is merino, and it doesn't yep. hold an odor. I mean, even if you wear it, I I've got a couple of garments I've worn for a couple of days. I notice that I smell a little ripe, but the garments honestly don't hold that stink. It's pretty neat stuff. <laughs> I, it's phenomenal stuff. So I, I think that helped yep. a little bit. Um, but I was also wearing light enough gear. So because I was walking, you know, I wasn't I wasn't walking real fast, but I was walking. And as I was coming out the backside, found a lot of uh, bucks on the backside. But I was heading towards where I thought they were bedded. And when I got to the break, what I mean by break is, I got to the point where there was a change in cover. I'm, I'm at the edge of the cover point. I didn't want to go into the area where it gets open. I stayed back in the cover, and from I figured that just on the other side of that open area, that's where all the deer most likely would be bedded based off of the information that I had gathered during my scouting run uh, for an hour the week before, or two weeks before. I sit down, and I, I'm a little quiet. Start with a little bleat. I do a sequence, uh, short, quick bleats with my, uh, my bleat call, followed by a couple of short grunts. Do that sequence a couple times, completely downwind of, of the bedding area, and then I see a doe pop up. She's about 40 yards out. It's like they just magically appeared. Everything I had read was right. They, they were bedded there, and I don't have any game cameras I'm using there. I'm not, I'm not all I have is sign. I'm working off a of sign and, and the windage that day and a bet that the deer would be moving in that area because they've probably been pressured a lot in other areas, and they've ended up there. And this doe pops up 40 yards out directly in front of me. I can see her. She can, she's looking right at me, but I'm well covered. The, the scent's blowing away from me, away from her, so she's, she's not winding me. And she looks happy as can be. She's nibbling, browsing, but she's acting like she's not alone. You ever see a deer act like they're not alone? Yeah, they'll look they'll look back or right. you know the right. Yeah, you know the man you're. They look like, they look they look back, but they feel relaxed. They look like they're nothing to worry about because I've got somebody else here with me that's kind of watching too. But they feel like they're isolated. A deer that feels isolated is relaxed, and they're just kind of bopping around and doing their playful thing. A deer, and you know, when they think that there could be harm, they're stopping, they're freezing, they're looking, they're 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 looking hard. Nothing like that. Completely relaxed. I'm like, this is good sign. But reading her body language told me that there was another deer in the area, and knowing the time of year, it could very easily be a buck. So I'm 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 just looking. I'm looking both sides, and I'm not. She's in a a semi clearing area, not a clearing, but a clear previous clear cut. That was only like probably 40 yards wide, 300 yards long, and she's right 40 yards from me. And then to my left, I see a little movement. I'm like, that's got to be another deer. And three minutes go by. I don't do any more calling. The buck stands, or this deer, I didn't know what it was at the time. Deer stands up, takes two steps. Now I see antler. Not a little antler. It looks like a mature New Hampshire buck based off of the, the width of what I could see. And it's still pretty good in the thick stuff. Then it takes two more steps. Now I've got a full view of this buck. I can see antler, lots of it. I can, And then it grunts, it grunts at the doe one time. The, the buck is probably 45 yards out. I've got my 30-06. I pull up. I, he's looking right at me in the scope. I draw down the neck a little bit, take a shot, and he drops in his tracks. He's dead before he hits the ground. The doe runs off, and I walk up. 
and definitely one of the the most in that area it was probably the dominant buck on that mountainside for at least a year or so. You know, he's that he's not a monster by like Ohio standards, but a good solid mature New Hampshire buck by New Hampshire standards. Very and cool. uh, I started getting great the, feeling. Yeah, man. it was great. Great feeling. Started uh, took a few took a few pictures, sent it to my buddies. Started gutting the deer out, and I was still downwind where that doe ran. The doe came back and started watching me <laughs> get her got her boyfriend oh. out. So, <laughs> so that, it, it was yeah, just a great hunt, yeah. you know. Crazy. Yeah. Well, and it's yeah. nice when everything comes together too. You you yep. did some scouting. You know, you took some of the stuff that you'd learned in the past and. You'd scouted this area, and I've got a few areas like that too, where it's like, hey, I should probably go back there and hunt it. And you know, yep. like you said, you got a few other areas in mind. You, well, I'm gonna go hunt these areas instead. And right. you know, and you go back a few years later, and look, the sign's still there. It's uh, you know, the deer know it well, and time to throw a sit at it. And you, yep. you picked the right time, and uh, the conditions were perfect. You approached it properly, yep. and um, everything went well. Yeah, they read That's the it. they read the script, as they would say. Yeah. Yep, it was it was just like a textbook. You read the sign, you plan the hunt, you approach it correctly based off the wind direction, the time of year, and the time of day, and don't go too far, but don't go not far enough. You know what I mean? There's there's a whole right. formula there, um, and we're talking the difference between 40 yards. If I went 40 yards more, if I even took 10 yards into that clear, those deer were close enough they probably would have seen me. But yeah, you'd I have bumped had them. to approach. I would have bumped them. But I, I guessed right based off the signs that I'd seen two weeks earlier that you got to be careful going in there. You can't come in from the north where everybody does because that's where the parking area is, you know, a mile and a half up the road or a mile and a half up through the, the swamp. That's where park people could park. That's where everybody's coming in from. I got to be smarter. I got to go in from the backside. I got to go in from the downwind side. I got to stay out of that that bedding area and if i do most likely if there are deer that day they'll pop up in that evening getting ready to go do their evening activities for sure and that's how it works how gratifying for you to to like kind of you know get that affirmation that this is the right way to do it and it worked how many times do we do that stuff and it doesn't work you're like what am i doing wrong exactly i did all the stuff for the deer you know and that's me anyways how many times have you gone in upwind how many times have you gone busting through the the bedding area how many times have you not gone at the right time of day how many times have you gone in where everybody else has gone in from it's happened a lot so not only you're hunting the deer but you're kind of hunting the hunter as well to make sure that you're you're going to areas where they go when they're pressured and making sure you don't go in the from the directions that the other hunters normally would if they were to do so so it's not just the deer. It's also finding where the hunters go to. Yep. Yeah, it's cool. Well, thanks so much for sharing that with us. Um, you know, we'll wrap up our live feed here. Why don't we um, just wrap up with letting folks know where they can find you. For those that don't know, which I think it's a very few, but, um, you know, share where they can listen, where they can learn, how they get in touch, all that good stuff. Sure. Yeah. Uh, if you just uh, go into iTunes, for example, type in Big Buck Registry or on Stitcher, uh, we're on YouTube, which is odd to me that people are listening on YouTube, but they are. Um, so we're on YouTube, Big Buck Registry, Facebook, Big Buck Registry. Um, you can go to the bigbuckregistry.com. That's our blog. Um, so basically, if you type in Big Buck Registry, you'll find the vast majority of our stuff in various locations. Nice. Cool. Nice and simple, just like you said. You're rocking it out. Right. Episode 300 is on the horizon, so we'll stay tuned for that. Um Thanks so much for being our guest tonight, Jay. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, we appreciate I it. I appreciate it as well, guys. I love what you guys are doing, so keep up the good work. Thanks for spending the last hour with me listening to the story behind the Big Buck Registry and the, my 2019 New Hampshire buck. It was uh, it was quite an adventure, and it's one I'll never forget. And I'll also never forget this COVID-19 thing, and I'll never forget the cardiac catheter surgery I just had. Do yourself a favor, even if you don't like going to the doctor, and I'm not a big fan, I never have been, but there's a time when being a middle-aged man with high cholesterol, high blood pressure that was creeping up, it's definitely worth a visit to your primary care provider. 
There's no doubt that I was in a high-risk situation, and that buck that I killed in 2019 could have been my last one. So please, if you're experiencing any of these symptoms, or if you just haven't been to the doctor in a while, and you think you're like me, do yourself a favor. Go get checked out. And please, everyone be safe. This COVID-19 coronavirus is nothing to be messed with. Is it hype? Is it is it overreaction? Perhaps. But I heard someone say, and I think I like this best, I'd rather overreact now and find out that we did than to find out we underreacted. So be safe, get out in the woods, and thanks for listening to the show. Dusty, where can we find you when you're not hanging out here in the studios with me? Uh, shoot me an email, dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. You can look me up on Instagram and Twitter at Chasing Antler, facebook.com forward slash chubby tines outdoors. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Likewise, you can shoot me an email, jay at bigbuckregistry.com, and you can visit us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We're also on Twitter, which is twitter.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We are also on Instagram, instagram.com forward slash bigbuckregistry, and YouTube, which is youtube.com forward slash big buck registry on YouTube. You can listen to all of our podcasts in their entirety. As far as videos are concerned, it's a boring video, but the audio content is there. So you can actually listen to our podcast. You can also listen to all of our live shows that we've done on Thursday nights when we do do them. And we've gone back and interviewed, re-interviewed a lot of our previous guests we had on the show just to put a face to a voice. Let's put it that way. You can always listen to our show on other places as well, not just YouTube. We're found on Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, and as an Amazon Alexa skill. Go to Alexa and say, Alexa, enable Big Buck Registry. And if you would like to submit a buck to our page for consideration and be featured on our page in front of 250,000 diehard deer hunting fans, all you have to do is go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck and all of the instructions will be right there. I think that's pretty much everywhere we're at. I think that's a wrap, Dusty. And that's a whole lot of big buck, Jay. I'm Dusty Phillips. And I'm Jay Scott Ammon. We'll see you next time right here on the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunt Podcast. Thank you.